Uh, good uh, morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, this is the Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan. We are today offering a press briefing by uh, activist Thai dissident uh, Pavin Chachaval Pun, and I apologize if uh, my pronunciation is uh, not uh, sufficient. Uh, we apologize also for the delay, 15 minutes, due to some uh, technical uh, reasons. I hope uh, this broadcast is now working. We are on YouTube, live, and Vimeo, I hope, or I think. Anyway, welcome everybody, especially a warm welcome to Pavin. This is not the first time uh, he's joining us at the Press Club here. Um, I I think just a short introduction of uh, uh, Pavin, uh, Professor Pavi. He is a professor at the Kyoto University Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and he is among the most well-known critics of the Thai monarchy and military government. He lives in Japan. He asked for asylum several years ago. He has been granted, actually one of the very few, I should say. And uh, he's uh, now organizing uh, uh, from Japan uh, protests, uh, at least he's contributing to, uh, to organize protests in, in Thailand. And he's um, a very, very popular uh, uh, discussion group on Facebook called the Royalist Marketplace has been shut down a couple of days ago under the request uh, of the Thai government in Thailand. Facebook uh, declared that they are going to protest and make a sue about this. But uh, uh, after a few hours, uh, a new group came up and has now, uh, at least uh, by yesterday, had uh, around 700,000 members. Uh, we will check with the Pavin if uh, in the meanwhile, the group has increased uh, further. Anyway, without any other ado, I would uh, like uh, to ask Pavin to take over with a short statement, and then uh, we will uh, ask uh, uh, online uh, journalists and colleagues uh, to ask questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe uh, you uh, you all have, do, do, do we have uh, uh, the chance to show where they have to send, send uh, I mean, it's here. I don't know if uh, uh, the link, you can send uh, questions to this link. The blue one, and uh, okay. So, Pavin, please uh, go ahead. Welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation. So, you are right. This is not the first time for me at the FCCJ, uh, but it's the first time though to be to be able to do this online uh, because of COVID. But first of all, uh, okay. Thank you for the invitation. First of all, I have to correct. You know the part some part of the introduction. I am not trying to set up a protest uh, in Thailand from Japan. That is not my intention. My intention basically just, you know, to, uh, to provide, to set up this Facebook group in order to provide it as a platform for a discussion, that's all. So that is a part of, I mean, a part of me being a professor because this is a part of ex experiment and also, you could say survey or even field work, you know, in order to uh, to see, to check how the people think about the monarchy. So this is a part of my project, but it just happened at the right time. The, the other reason is that basically I'm just a Thai, I am just a Thai person, a Thai citizen, despite they do not want me to be Thai, uh, who just basically care about my country. So setting up that group, uh, sort of fulfill my own personal uh, objective as well. So, okay, let me start by getting into uh, the discussion today. I believe I have about 20 minutes. I'll try to be, uh, uh, I try to keep that, you know, in my, uh, the time limit. So uh, this, this talk will be, will be divided in two parts. The first one is basically the current situation and whatever going on with my group. The other one, I'll try to talk about the current uh, protest in Thailand long-term prospect and whether the current, uh, this, the, the current protest would in any way change uh, the 
political trajectory of Thailand. The first part is uh, about the group. You know, it, it had become international headline. Okay, uh, in the middle of a COVID pandemic, many months ago, uh, there's a number of Facebook group coming up, and uh, with with this concept of marketplace. Okay, uh, the the I think I think the group that started off is Jurulongkorn University Marketplace. Is Jurulongkorn is number one you know, university of Thailand, that where I graduated from as well. So in order to keep this as a venue for the alumni or the student to come and then buy and sell product in order, in order to help uh, lessen the economic hardship you know, of the people. So I thought that why not? Why can't I set up uh, this kind of marketplace uh, where this could become a platform you know, where people can come and then talk about the monarchy, where the idea and also the uh, the view or the, op the opinion about the monarchy can be traded, right? Just like you trade things in the market. So that is the original thought of Royalist Marketplace. And I purposefully picked the name Royalist just to make it a little bit more funny because if our group is anything, but it's not Royalist. So that's why, you know, I mean, to be a little bit more sarcastic, so I called it Loyalist Marketplace. It was set up on the 16th of April. The first week, you know, it was, it was just all fun, fun stuff. It's just basically joke, parody, uh, satire, you know, because you have, you have to also understand that talking about the monarchy in Thailand continues to be a taboo subject. Maybe one way of trying to erase that kind of taboo is to make fun of it. You know, this has become sort of technique around the world. So I think the first week, you know, people try to come up with some jokes about it. But then, you know, over time, say the second or the third week, I started to realize that the number had gone up quite quickly. Then I told myself that, oh my God, yeah, maybe this could be something that, that I can turn it into, into a framework or an avenue of discussion more meaningfully. So after that, I think about a month that when I started to be very serious about developing this group into a proper discussion block where we really go into serious discussion about the monarchy. Uh, because uh, even though the monarchy has become the most important political institution in Thailand, sitting on top of the political structure, but yet you know, we cannot talk about this issue openly Again, even when this institution, you know, cause an impact on our life on a daily basis. So what kind of uh, serious discussion we are talking about within this group? For example, uh, we would bring up discussion of uh, the royal intervention in politics. For example, how many times the king, especially King Kumipon, the previous king, endorsed Nuchiku? Because this could also, you know, go into a discussion of the intimate relationship between the military and the monarchy. We also have to admit that the strength of the monarchy has long been underpinned by the military. And at the same time, the military sort of exploited the monarchy in order to preserve its own political position as well. So this sort of becoming interrelation, interdependent relationship. Discussion would also include something like the, the, the financial status of the king. Right, we are we are talking about uh, the the super rich crowd property bureau, you know, with estimated asset of up to sixty billion U.S. dollars now under the sole possession of the current king, King Washington. And then, I mean, the 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 the, the topic continue go on and on and on, to the point of you know even even the most sensitive subject of the abductions and killings of anti-monarchies dissident overseas, uh, that a lot of people want to know what kind of connection, involvement of the palace, you know, with this kind of crime. So basically this, as I said, has become very, very serious discussion. And I think it's quite refreshing, you know, to see that most of the members of the Royalist Marketplace, they are in the younger generation. Uh, and then for the younger gener generation to stand up and start started to understand the importance of the discussion of the monarchy, I find that so refreshing. 
I find that maybe at the end of the day, my country still have some hope. You know, if we think about moving uh, toward democratization, now it becomes so it has become so popular. And by a by by August, so months later, we hit one million members. I think as of now, even though it even though its access has been blocked in Thailand, we still have about 1.1 million members, making it the 18th largest Facebook group in the world. So, I mean, it's very powerful in many ways. Definitely, it's the biggest uh, Facebook group in Thailand. It's the fastest, fastest growing social media platform in Thailand too. Because of that, I think the government found it as a threat. So the first step for the government was uh, trying to talk Facebook out, you know, uh, into shutting down altogether this group. At the beginning, Facebook rejected the request. Then when the, when the government realized that the government could not do anything in that initial state, then the, the government turned to me, basically punishing me. Uh, a week ago, uh, the Ministry of uh, Digital Economy and Society filed a complaint with the police against me on charge of cybercrime. Cybercrime, this is under the Computer Crime Act. Uh, Cybercrime means they accuse me of entering false information about the monarch monarchy uh, on the internet, right? We can talk about it, your Computer Crime Act a, li a little bit later, but it's, it has become a new legal, legal tool in Thailand in curbing criticism against the monarchy. You know, in the past, we're talking about less majestic law, but less majestic law caused so much you know, damage to the image of the monarchy if there is such thing called image of the, of the monarchy today. But nonetheless, you know, they, they, they do not want to use less, less majestic now. So they switch to Computer Crime Act. So for now, the same crime that you commit, if you think this is a crime about criticizing the monarchy, they no longer charge you with less majestic, but they charge you with computer crime. So yeah, that, that, that was the charge that they put it up against me. I'm sure that the police is now working on it and Soon, I might be receiving sort of uh, arrest warrant, maybe one more arrest warrant because I already have a few arrest warrant that would add up in my CV then. Uh, yeah, but then again, you know, punishing me doesn't mean that they could still block information on the Royalist Marketplace group. So the third step for them is basically to go back to Facebook again. And this time asking the Facebook for, uh, to block access, its access to Thailand by using a low domestic law, basically this Computer Crime Act, threatening Facebook that if Facebook does not comply with, with a local law, the Thai government will take uh, Facebook to court. So that, that, that was the, the third step, right? So me, initially, I, I would not believe you know, what, that Facebook would comply with the government just like first time. Unfortunately though, uh, on uh, Monday, Monday evening, I got I got FaceTime call from Facebook staff, you know, two of them, one in Singapore and one from Bangkok. Basically, these people happen to be my friend before they joined Facebook. So we have remained friends. So they FaceTime me to say that, Pavin, you know, uh, Facebook doesn't have to inform you the following, but we inform you because we are friends. So we want to inform you that in the next few hours, Facebook would block access to your group in Thailand. We can't do anything because you know, we have to comply with the local law. And then I think they tried so hard to be apologetic that we understand your group, you know, but, but this is something that we cannot avoid because we do not want to get into sort of legal battle with the Thai government too. Oh my God, I was so angry, you know, at my friends and also at Facebook, you know, in particular, uh, and I scream, I remember. But then there's nothing I could do because I think I am dealing with this, uh, this situation from a passive perspective, you know, because I don't have any bargaining power, you know, to, to negotiate on it or anything. So I have to accept it. So I just hung up that FaceTime call. Immediately, I informed my member, over a million people, saying that Facebook would block an access. So I will start the new group right away. And I hope that you will pack your bag and then move to the new house with me immediately. So this has been the greatest exodus, you know, in the history, you know, of, of the world, maybe in such a short period of time, you know, uh, after you have seen that in the Old Testament of the exodus, 
uh, overnight after it, it in fact the the block uh, the, the 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 blocking of the group was effective about about 11 p.m. on Monday. Eventually, my group disappeared from the cyberspace uh, in Thailand at around uh, 11, uh, 11 p.m. Let me see the time. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then the group, the group was already out there, the new group. And then overnight, I have half a million. And as I speak to you now, I checked this morning, we are approaching 900,000 members. I think soon we're gonna go back to a million, right? So, okay, after I woke up the next day, then I, I found a news, uh, breaking news of Facebook now shifting its position, wanting to sue the government for uh, forcing Facebook to block an access. That is the, the latest development. I am not so sure what will happen next. Nobody informed me then. Okay, I'll wrap up this first part before I move to the second part. The first part basically about the, the drama with the, the group, with Facebook, with the Thai government. Uh, what do I think about this? Well, I mean, the, 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 minister of, uh, the Minister of Digital Economy and Society came out two days ago, being so adamant that, you know, if Facebook want to sue, then the Thai government will fight, will fight to the end. And then they, they use this term, they want to protect cyber sovereignty of Thailand. Now, this is totally new terminology that I will have to go back and try to think what does it really mean? Cyber sovereignty of Thailand. Uh, well, I mean, I think, I think Facebook shifting position, that is something to be commended because at least, you know, Facebook uh, realized that it is important to defend this is basic human right for free, free speech. Uh, and then it's, it's so important for Facebook to do so because Facebook is the world's uh, largest social media platform. I mean, Facebook is so powerful. You know, if you want to get into social media, you can't run away from Facebook. And that's why, you know, my activity on Facebook, you know, is so important. And Facebook has remained so important for me too. So I think as, you know, as the biggest, social media platform, I think Facebook has certain uh, responsibility and commitment to ensure that, you know, whatever we discuss online, you know, has to be guaranteed under this, you know, freedom of expression. So Facebook has to stand firm on that principle, right? But then, I mean, if you look, look back to Facebook has not always been firm. Sometimes Facebook, you know, cooperated with dictatorial regime, authoritarian regime. For example, it accepted, you know, the, the request from the government at the beginning. And also, even until today, they continue to take down certain posts requested by the Thai government, my own posts, that they, they think critical of the monarchy. So I think the problem here with Facebook is the inconsistency of the Facebook position that, you know, make social media user being so unsure whether this time Facebook will be on our side or, the, or next time Facebook would be on the government side. I think this inconsistency come about because sometimes Facebook think too much about cost benefit factor, about the financial gains that would come out you know, of its operation rather than thinking carefully about the commitment that we're talking about to guarantee, to assure freedom of speech online. So I just would like to leave this you know, final message to Facebook. Uh, you could use this case the royalist marketplace to set a good standard, you know, that Facebook will stand on the people, especially when it comes to defending the right to speak freely. The last part, I'll try to finish in 10 minutes. Uh, how this, you know, uh, the, the, the royalist marketplace saga, you know, fit into the current ongoing student protest in Thailand. You could see that the two things, you know, happen at the same time. One activity on the cyberspace led by royalist marketplace, and one, you know, the student on the street, uh, pro-democracy movement, right? It is true that, that the group came before the, the protest, but I would not claim that, you know, our group basically, how to say, motivated the student to go on the street, because I think that would be too much to claim for. I would say that though, that we play a tiny part, you know, in, in supporting the student agenda, right? So, uh, 
Now the two things go at the same time, side by side. The student have become so courageous, you know, just as we are courageous on the cyberspace through the Royalist Marketplace Group. The student became uh, very courageous by coming up with the request for immediate monarchical reform. And this thing, I could see it as a kind of turning point in Thai politics too. It is true that in the past, you know, people already talk about monarchy in public, but mainly in the past, that was about criticism alone. This time though, the student come up with 10 points. The points that they think that's so important for the survival of the monarchy and to put the monarchy back into the, cons in, in the, constitution, in the constitution. These are formal proposals that, that are so ready to be taken by political party to, for serious discussion in the parliament. We can talk about this a bit later on because I believe that you know, no political party would dare to take this further into the parliament because it is so risky, you know, it is very contentious. But we have to commend the student today uh, for raising this critical issue. Now, I would not go into 10 points, but I would pick certain elements, very important elements. For example, they, they would uh, suggest uh, the abolition of uh, Article 6 that you know, from now on, the monarchy could be charged. Because I mean, under the traditional thinking, traditional law, no one could no one could file complaints against the monarchy. So basically, the monarchy in the past can do no wrong. So what what the student try to say that no, no, it's not. The student can do wrong, and we can charge, you know, the 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 the, the, the king. Then it go into uh, the abolition of less majesty law. Then it's going to a discussion of why the king has to have his own personal military army. Because I mean, this is so important too, because you know, the, the king exploited the army in order to underpin, strengthen his own power position. The dis discussion going to the Crown Property Bureau, as I mentioned earlier, about the, the, the wealth of the current king. Now it has to, the student want it to be clear what really belong to the institution and what belong to, you know, personally to the king. Last point is so important too, about the investigation into the abduction and killing of the anti uh, monarchies uh, dissident across the border. I think this one is so important, as I mentioned earlier too, that there seemed to be a suggestion that there's an involvement of the pilot into this kind of crimes. So uh, we, I mean, at the group, we definitely support the, 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 the proposal because this is what we're really waiting for. Open discussion of the monarchy, putting the monarchy back into the constitution. This is something very, very legal, very legitimate. There's nothing about insulting the monarchy or anything, nothing illegal here. Uh, and then why, why this become the twin engine that the Thai government has become uh, frightened? Because, you know, the member, over a million member of, of the Royalist Marketplace group, they are younger generation. The people who go on the street, they're also young people too. The two group of, you know, of, of this twin engine sort of overlap with each other. So that's why, you know, those who, you know, have a discussion in the group, can take it out, you know, to air it on the street. That's what makes it quite powerful. And once again, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it is very important to talk about the monarchy. We are in 2020. We cannot avoid talking about the most important issue, you know, uh, facing Thailand. In fact, if you want to look at the Thai political crisis since 2005, when the first anti toxin movement started, you know, leading to the coup of 2006 and then the coup of 2014. You might blame the military, yes, you can. But I think the source of the Thai conflict, not just only Thaksin, not just only the military, but the real problem lie with the monarchy. And that's why the student and we as a group want, you know, people to come and really have a discussion about this. Lastly, uh, just give me a few more minutes, a few minutes. Uh, how this game will end. As for the group, uh, the minister already came out to say that they already, he already know of the new group approaching a million. He said that he would do the same thing, that he would request the, uh, Facebook to block it. Again, I immediately responded by saying that you block it again, I will open it again. If you know you will not stop, I won't stop. And I work from home, I have plenty of time to do so. So, uh, no, they can't, they can no longer block access to information like this. You know, I will not let that happen. 
As for the student, that is more crucial because they are on the street. Right now, they are using legal tools in dealing with protester. They're using legal tool to against the group. They are now using legal tool against the student. For example, they started to arrest you know, a number of, of uh, protester. They, they are doing it on a daily basis now. They just want to make, they just want to cause nuisance, want to make them you know, unable to continue with the protest. But knowing the student as well, when they bring up you know, this issue of monarchical reform, this is a turning point, as I said, they push the boundary so far. They, they lift up the ceiling so high that I do not think the student would come down. When the government realized that the student would never come down, now it's up to the government how the government would deal with the student. I know, I'm not so sure. From today, after legal, legal instrument, what else the government would do? I think, I think, that, I, I think that, is, that is something at this end. This end is legal instrument. And then it, I think, I think the, 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 the government approach would continue to intensify, intensify. I don't know how, I don't know how, but I know that the end game there would be perhaps the use of force. So I think from legal tool to the use of force, there could be something in between to kill the time until the government realized that they really have to stop the protest that then maybe use of force might be introduced. And lastly, use of force against students is not, it's nothing new. It's not uncommon in the Thai political context because it happened before at Thammasat University in 1926 with massacre against Thammasat students. So I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit worried that you know, history could repeat itself. And then just when you think that this government would not do such stupid thing, you, know, you might give them too much credit because when they are pushed to the corner, the government, I think they would be happy to even to use the most ruthless measure like use of force. So I just, I just want, this is really last point. I mean, it's a good opportunity to speak today at the FCCJ so that the international community would know. And then I think, I think the, the important part is that the support from the international community is crucial, at least you know, to be sort of a shield, a protection for the student. It might not guarantee anything, but at least you know, international pressure you know, that would protect the student against the government is needed right now. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Pavin. Very clear and articulated presentation. Now let's talk about uh, uh, present situation in uh, Thailand. Uh, I understand that uh, today too and during the weekend there will be protests. Uh, what do you expect from uh, these protests? Uh, and uh, uh, you say that you are not uh, uh, organizing them. I apologize, I don't want to put you in trouble more than you are already. Uh, but certainly you do have uh, a role at least through your uh, group. So how do you, uh, how much, how many people do you think will join and uh, what could be the possible development in, during this weekend? I think for the student, the important part, uh, the important mission for the, the, the student uh, is to sustain this political activism to ensure that you know, they could pro prolong uh, the, the protest as far as it could go, because I think uh, the ultimate aim for them is basically the government. We have to take uh, the, the, the request, the demand for reform into consideration. Otherwise, the student would not back up, as I said in my presentation. So yeah, this coming weekend, it would be another big event in Bangkok. Uh, and it would never stop. I mean, I, I'm sure that every weekend now, it would continue to, to happen. And it's just not, not just about in Bangkok. You know, through my group, I know it because I, I administer the group that meetings are now being held throughout the country, across the nation, not necessarily led by the student, but led by ordinary people, middle-aged people, including old people who are now coming out to support the student. So what we could expect from this weekend, I think more or less it would be the same message. The same, the same message is, it's time for us to talk about the monarchy openly and the reform. You know, if, uh, if my estimation would be, would be correct, the last time, last weekend, we have a lot, I mean, tens of thousands of people uh, flocking to, you know, the Democracy Monument. I'm sure that the number, if not 
if not the same, it would be more because this 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 is the first big gathering in the aftermath of the blocking of the loyalist marketplace. So you could see two things: maybe the increasing number of the student. Second, the emphasis on the demand of the student for monarchical reform. Thank you, Pavin. While we are waiting for the questions, uh, there is al also already one coming in, uh, but I'd rather ask it uh, later on. Let, let's just uh, continue a little bit uh, between us. Uh, um, recently, all over Asia, East Asia, there have been uh, this um, uh, involvement of uh, young people, students in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Thai movement also has got a lot of support from these people. I remember last year, Joshua Wong came there. Uh, how could you read this? Uh, is, is there any, something uh, going on in East Asia uh, uh, toward uh, more involvement of uh, young people uh, in democratic uh, activities in your opinion? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, if, if Huntington talked about third wave of democracy in the past, I would think that this is a new wave of, the, of, of democratization, you know, uh, at least in the context of the Asia Pacific, let me put that way. Uh, yes, it's a new wave and it's very, very current, very refreshing wave. It's, it's a wave that is, that, that is participated by younger generation like you yourself said. We have seen a lot of commonality between uh, the Thai protests, Hong Kong protests, and also, uh, you know, protests in, in Taiwan something like that, the so-called uh, multi alliance. Now it become a new political discourse uh, describing the participation of younger generation into this kind of protest. So uh, yes, I think, I, I think because of this, and, and I mean, this goes to show also the transnational movement that whatever happened in one country, one territory, no longer you know, confined within that location, but it's sort of sent out, proliferate, the influence across the border. I'm sure that you know Thai students look up to their Hong Kong uh, counterpart, and then I think they uh, they give each other moral support. Yes, Joshua Wong was invited, you know, by a Thai student in the past, but unfortunately, you know, he couldn't he, leave the airport, right? No, he could not go <laughs> to show that the Thai government, you know, sub, uh, succumb to the the demand from Beijing not to allow Joshua Wong, you know, to even leave the Thai airport into uh, the city so but 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 yes that is that that is something that uh hi that highlight you know the i would say the i mean i don't know whether this term would be a bit old-fashioned comradeship that might sound a little bit too communist i would say maybe uh alliance partnership among younger generation uh yeah i, I think i think they keep each other best practices Definitely in terms of ideology also as well. The ideology here is important because this about the fight of the young people against traditional elites, you know, in the context of Hong Kong. This is about traditional, you know, Ancien regime of Beijing in Thailand. This is about young versus traditional elites in the form of network monarchy, right? Uh, that is one thing that they share in common. And then uh, tactic, for example, they use pop culture. This is something that I'm so excited. You know, this I have not seen in the past before. Pop culture, this is basically to link, you know, the young, you know, to make them, to make the, the protest more colorful so that, you know, it would attract more and more and more students coming out. For example, uh, these Thai activists, you know, dressing up as Harry Potter, talking, yes. about, talking about how it's so important for Harry Potter to fight all the evils, this and that. Let, let yeah. me... Let me just interrupt you on, do you had any role in choosing uh, the Miyazaki uh, 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 song for the movement? Well, I mean, I don't, <laughs> but, when I, but then I become a part of this, you know, pop culture thing, especially, I mean, this is something that I have not approved, but they just take it, basically they print out my photo, you know, with my Chihuahua, you know, <laughs> Shisai Inu. Right, and then put in a gold frame, and then they hold it up in the in 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 the in the protest. Again, I have to say that without my approval. But then I think they do it basically. This is a part of pop culture, as I said, and it's such a brilliant way. If you want to desacralize something that is so sacralized, 
a good way to go. Okay, Pavin, uh, let me ask you the question that came through uh, from uh, our uh, member uh, of the board, uh, Simon uh, Farrell. He's uh, asking what actually many, many people, I, I believe, uh, would ask. Um, has the Japanese government asked you to refrain from uh, criticizing uh, the Thai monarchy whilst you are in Japan? or otherwise spoken to you about uh, this issue. Uh, and I would add uh, not only the government, but also the academic world. You, you work for a uni an university. Have uh, the university authorities uh, told you, you know, calm down, don't, don't, don't exaggerate? I am so blessed. And, and, and this is uh, truthful that even at the worst time in my life, you know, in the aftermath of the of the coup of 2014, when uh, when they issued a warrant for my arrest, you know, and I did nothing wrong, they accused me of being critical of the monarchy. Then they issued a warrant for my arrest. Then they revoked my passport, forcing me to apply for refugee status with with Japanese government. Up until today, not even once the Japanese government or including Kyoto University, you know, come uh, come came to me, and then and then asked me to tone it down. Never ever. So, uh, so that, that is something that I, I think, yeah, I am blessed, you know, to be in a country where the government understands the importance of promotion of democracy, promotion, I mean, protection of human rights, you know. I would not go as far as, you know, Japan is very enthusiastic, Japanese government is very enthusiastic about, oh my God, yeah, defending academic freedom, defending democracy not just in Japan, but elsewhere as well. No, I would not go that far. But at the same time, you know, the Japanese government and also Kyoto University, they are, they, they understand the situation. And then they just, they, they would never, you know, jump up and down. And they, yeah, but we're doing the right thing. No, they would not. But then at the same time, they never abandon me, you know, even in, 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 in the worst time. So that they just give me one message, you know, be responsible, that's all. Okay, but in the past you have been uh, object of uh, some uh, kind of uh, uh, very uh, dangerous attack in your own home. I, I don't want to uh, uh, ask about that, but are you afraid right now? Are you somehow scared? Do you take any precaution uh, uh, along you know, the, the, the problem, the, the, the risk of getting attacked again at your own home? Well, to be honest, to say that I'm not afraid, then I would lie, because the, especially with the group now becoming uh, such a, a threat uh, to to uh, the Thai government, then of course the chance of, of of this kind of incident would happen again. You know, it's still there. Uh, but then I come to terms with that too. You know, because I have come very far, and if this is something that you know that motivate me, it become my my passion that you know I want to see democratization process in my country. So if this would be uh, a bit risky, then I would take it, right? But I mean, uh, just, just to end up this, this kind of conversation, I have to thank Japanese police, even though after a year, you know, we still cannot arrest, you know, the culprit. The, the Japanese uh, police continue to reassure me that the investigation is ongoing. And then, you know, after the setting up of the group, uh, our, our, our communication has become intensified as well. So uh, yeah, we, I keep uh, in constant contact with the Japanese uh, police up until today. In fact, I'll be meeting them today in the afternoon. Uh, Pavin, we still have a few minutes uh, and there are no questions coming in. So let me keep on this uh, uh, talk between us. Uh, last time we spoke, you, you, you made an interesting uh, uh, statement about the role of academics. Uh, their supposed uh, neutrality on issues, including this one. Uh, and you told uh, uh, that you are uh, um, somehow uh, 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 supporting uh, the neutrality of academics. But to be honest, uh, uh, your role right now is uh, not exactly uh, a one of neutrality. I mean, you are taking sides, you are asking uh, uh, for uh, reforms and stuff like that. So. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, where is the border? Where is the limit a, a scholar like you, an academic, can involve himself or herself into 
political activities, even just uh, you know virtually like you are doing now. But I guess if you were not in Japan, you would now join the streets or the university, right? Well, I mean, uh, this this is not just just a, a useful discussion within this particular. I mean, under under the current what we are speaking now, this situation at the FCC say, but it has been long debate, even in the academic world. What is the definition of being an academic? Whether academic could cross into political, political activism, whether academic could become political activist. I, I think I welcome both worlds. Why stop yourself being an academic and not doing political activist? I think either people will, 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 will agree with me or not, I think one of the one of the main responsibility of the academic, not just only doing your own research, you have to bring up a public agenda. You have to be able to you have to have courage to talk about even the most contentious agenda. So this is what I have been doing for a long, long time. Of course, a lot of people would disagree with my position that maybe I have gone too far out of the academic world. Yeah, but but I I see that this is the responsibility of academic to have to push an important agenda. Right. So, uh, so because of that, I think I can combine the two worlds together. And I like to say that I have done it quite okay. I mean, if you say it brilliantly, then I would, you know, self glorify. Uh, are the academic and the neutrality? I said that before. People might think that I am not neutral. I don't mind if the, if people think that I take side. I don't mind if they think that I am biased, but if that bias is only for the promotion of democracy, yes, I would like to take that, that criticism. That in a situation like this, you know, when you only have two choices, democracy or author, authoritarianism, I would want to take side. Then, and I don't care if people would criticize me on that. Now, for other people, other academics who want to remain neutral, I understand too, especially those who live inside Thailand. You know, there's, there's a lot to take, there's a price to pay if you live in Thailand, being an academic, and if you come out to criticize the monarchy, of course you will become target immediately. I would not be able to do whatever I am doing now if I still live in Thailand. So for them, for the sake of their own safety, maybe they might have to be neutral, that I understand. But I think for me, I only speak for me, as an academic teaching Thai politics, I would lie to myself. I would be dishonest to myself to teach students about political problem and then try to avoid the issue of the monarchy. So I think for me, it is so important to go into this, the most sensitive, difficult issue, even if there's a price to pay, as I said, but I just want to be honest to myself. Well, try to be honest with uh, yourself and, we, and with us. If situation develops in a good way, would you consider running for elections in Thailand, provided that you can go back there? Uh, well, you mean running, pro running for president? No, 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 not for president. <laughs> I mean, not no, right no. away. Not right away. No, no, no I'm mean, joking. I'm just joking. in the parliament. In the parliament. Sure, sure. I mean, the, the, the term president that is basically to suggest that <laughs> Thailand would become republic yes. uh, in the past. No, no. I mean, right now, of course not. I mean, that's, that's nothing set in stone, but I am 99% you know, confident that I would not cross the, that boundary, you know, I could be, I could be a lot, you know, I could have a lot of personality being an academic, you know, if anyone okay. follow me, they would know that, you know, I do TikTok, this and that, I come out so camp, this and that, but then there is one thing that I never think of is to become a politician, because you I just, think You just mentioned the TikTok and before Facebook, let me just jump on this, uh, we are now live on YouTube, which is owned uh, at, at least until a few hours ago uh, by uh, um, uh, Google, right? Yeah. Do you fear, could, could there any risk that Google uh, would follow suit Facebook and block? Well, everything is possible. They already blocked my TikTok in Thailand. So, I mean, with, the, with my first clip, you know, that I make fun of, you know, of politician and immediately they blocked my TikTok. <laughs> only my TikTok only see you know, can be seen from outside the country. Everything is possible at this point, but again, you know, with younger generation, they will find way to see it, even if, if it is blocked. So right. you know, I, I'm, I'm not worried about it. We have uh, another interesting question coming from uh, uh, Ilgin uh, Hulmat, member of uh, the new board of the uh, Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan. Um, 
what is the general reaction, if there is one, and the level of support from Japanese public uh, with its utmost respect for their emperor in your demand for more democracy from Thai monarchy. You know, Japan is the other country that has uh, a, 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 not only a king, an emperor, but with totally different uh, support and totally different role, I would say. Uh, do you have any reaction from your uh, Japanese supporter, your... Uh, uh okay well i mean uh with respect to japanese people and i have to respect them a lot and respect this country you know for providing shelter you know for me you have to understand the nature of you know japanese people this country that somehow though uh international inter international uh incident can i say that what will, what will happen outside the border of Japan usually is of little concern of the people. You know, Japanese people really live in an island, right? And then uh, become so consumed within, you know, its own domestic issues that sometimes, you know, they overlook international issues. Let me put that way, international issues. So I, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, happened in Thailand, maybe some, only some Japanese, you know, might follow it closely. But otherwise, I think, you know, a lot of Japanese people, may, might, they might not even know what really going on in, in Thailand. So let alone for them uh, to come and, and give support, you know, to, to the ongoing pro democratization process, you know, in, in my own country. So let me, let me summarize that. Yeah, I think it, it, it is of little concern of, of the Japanese people. And believe it or not, in the past few days, you know, I got a lot of, you know, in, interview requests by international media only one from Japanese media. So that go to show also of, go to show that the level of enthusiasm even among the Japanese media about what really go, going on inside Thailand. Well, we should add also that the Japanese emperor is not certainly not behaving like your king. I mean, is uh, can you tell us uh, about your king? I mean, I don't want to put you in more trouble that you are already, but. I mean, how come that this uh, this king is in garmish pattern king, uh, uh, you know, enjoying a long uh, holiday in the ski slopes, and while your country, you know, endures uh, all these um, issues? I mean, uh, if you could uh, talk freely to the king, suppose that the king is now online on YouTube, what would you tell him? Uh, well, uh, well, <laughs> I would say, come home, honey. <laughs> uh, but more, more than that, I mean, this, this, this also, this also a, 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 a very important question that, you know, hit so hard, you know, right at the, the core of the reform, you know, uh, yeah. What can I say about the current king? And I can say it again, because I have said it so million times, uh, very different from his father. He has, you know, he had built up this bad reputation about himself. And I think he know it, you know, since, since he's a, a young guy, a young man, and then not only he has never changed, but, the, but that bad behavior continue to be so, uh, how to say, it's worsened, you know, it's, it's, it's never get better. And, and because of that, I think, I will try to be brief here. I think that's, that's why the younger generation, they become so frustrated when they see their king. In the middle of COVID, you know, with, I said, I've talked about the economic hardship, you know, they see their king having a good time in, in Germany and then, you know, only come home to Thailand briefly, treating Thailand as holiday home because now they, he live uh, permanently in, in Germany. And I think the students think this is not right. Why they think it is not right and they dare to say it? Because this young generation, I would say they're about 20, early 20, they are so lucky that they managed to escape decades of propaganda and glorification program of the previous king. I was under that decade, so it's very hard for me to get out of it. But this younger generation, when they grew up to become teenagers, that was the decline of the previous reign. So in other words, they already escaped from it. So which means in their head, it's quite fresh and new, being, not being spoiled by propaganda. That's why they could see the king today as as he is without being courted, you know, by all the pomps and then 
or the magical story which is so untrue. So yeah, I would say, I would tell him that you know please come home because your home is Thailand and you live on the taxpayer money. Do you think he will? No. You stay there. Okay. Uh, all right. I think we are very close. I mean, we thank you for uh, your time. Uh, if can you stay another few minutes yeah. since we started uh, a little bit late? Um, how do you uh, 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 compare the reaction of uh, the Asian countries that have been involved with uh, protests recently, including Hong Kong, uh, with what happens uh, in the Middle East, where uh, violence is uh, a daily issue? Um, what is the difference between, uh, I mean, even your country is run now by, you know, a, a, a limited uh, democracy with, with former army officers on, on the top, but still there is no violent uh, repression, uh, nor there is for the moment in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, while uh, Syria, Lebanon, and uh, other countries have uh, seen this reaction, uh, 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 what is the difference? Well, yeah, uh, uh, let me write it down, okay. I think uh, I already I have two points to say. Well, after the Cold War, people, people, you know, immediately rushed to celebrate. Oh my God, yeah, the end of the Cold War is the end of history. That democracy would be eventually prevail. But then 20 years later, in 2020, or 30 years now, in fact, you know, that, that is not true. It, what, what is not true is that we, I mean, demo, democracy is basically just, just something very temporary, you know, in my country. I can even say that maybe we might not even have time long enough, you know, to cherish uh, democracy. So uh, it's still a rare commodity, you know, and I think this phenomenon also happened elsewhere, as you yourself said, you know, in, in the Middle East, Hong Kong, after 1997, we thought that this is, you know, one country, two system would work, no, it's fail, right? So I think this go to prove that the struggle for democratization, you know, is an unending process, no matter where you are. Second point is that, yeah, I mean, there is something that, and this is, this is a, a new topic that I am now doing research. Apart from, do, uh, apart from the state using violence crackdown, they have other ways now to deal with protests. And if you think that, you know, the cyberspace now become the front line in terms of, you know, the, the, the battlefield between the government vis-a-vis -vis the people, they have become sophisticated. When I say sophisticated, because there is now sort of a new theme of study called sophisticated autocrats. What do you mean by sophisticated autocrat? They use, they take advantage of information in order to suppress dissident without having to resort to uh, violent, violent rep rep repression. Blocking lawyers marketplace is one of that, one of the sophisticated method of them without having to use military force against you. But yes, at the same time, we are able to use information to control public opinion by blocking or by various things, blocking, filter out, you know, uh, critical, critical comment, using the certain information to promote the government excessively, something like that. Thank you, Pravin. Thank you very much for your uh, time and for your participation with us. I hope we will uh, keep in touch again. If any big developments are happening in, uh, in Thai, we will certainly call you again to update us. Um, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who followed uh, this uh, broadcast from uh, Foreign Correspondent Club uh, of uh, uh, Japan, you know, of Tokyo. Uh, and uh, see you at the next uh, occasion. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.